Morning, everyone. Just want to check that we're all here before I uh, get talking. Ah, I can see Ash is here as well. Um, welcome to this talk on previous inconsistent decisions in planning. Um, Joe, Ashley and I are going to talk for around 40 minutes um, and then leave some time at the end for questions. We're aware that some people have put questions to us when signing up and um, we've tried to do our best to answer as many of those as possible in the content of the talk itself. But of course, if anything remains unclear or anything um, arises during the discussion, then by all means ask away. Uh, there's a chat function at the bottom of the screen and you can also ask in the old fashioned way uh, by using the microphone. Now, the question that we're considering in this webinar is when must a decision maker consider earlier decisions? That issue, this doctrine of consistency between decisions, um, has been of interest for some time, both to planning lawyers, but also more generally to public lawyers. And what we aim to do in this talk is to examine that issue in the light of Joe's recent case um, of Blacker and Chelmsford City Council. And that is uh, a case that he was involved in towards the end of last year. Um, now, in terms of the overview, um, and this is the next slide, Joe, um, there are three main topics um, that we'll cover. The first is an overview of the key decisions and principles um, from the pre-Blacker case law. Um, I'll be dealing with that. Uh, the second is the judgment itself, um, the background, the decision, its effect. Um, and thirdly, Ashley will end by discussing the implications um, of that case uh, in this area of law uh, and issues for the future. Now, in terms of pre-Blacker case law, um, and on to the next slide, um, this discussion is not intended to be uh, exhaustive. Um, there's a lot of case law in this area. The aim is simply to give an overview of the main principles in order to put the Blacker discussion um, uh, in context. Uh, and for those purposes, I'd suggest that there are three particularly important cases. Uh, the first is North Wiltshire District Council from 1993, and this is regarded as laying down the classic statement, really, of the law uh, in this area. Um, and on to the next slide. Uh, this case concerned developers who had proposed to build a house and a garage within a walled garden to an existing property. And in policy terms, the issue was whether the appeal site was within the physical limits of the village. Now, in 1982, an inspector had decided on appeal that the site lay outside of the physical limits of the village. And in 1990, on a fresh appeal, uh, an inspector disagreed with that decision, found that the site was within the, the limits of the village, um, that there was no policy conflict and granted permission. Now, the council argued in that case that the inconsistency between the 1990 and the 1982 decisions uh, rendered that 1990 decision unlawful and the Court of Appeal agreed. The judges dismissed the Secretary of State's appeal and upheld the trial judge's findings that the decision was unlawful. Now Lord Justice Mann noted the common ground between the parties that previous appeal decisions can be material considerations in planning terms. He said that in principle that's indisputable, like cases should be treated alike. And consistency between decisions is important, not just for developers, but also for ensuring public confidence in the planning system. So this doctrine of consistency uh, has a clear rationale, both in practical, but also uh, in public law and broader constitutional terms. However, the Court of Appeals at pains to stress there are limits to this doctrine, and this is on the next slide. Uh, in particular, uh, the inspector or the decision maker making the second decision must always exercise his or her judgment. There is no obligation to treat like cases alike. What the decision maker has to do is consider the earlier decision and give reasons, if departing from it, give reasons for that departure. And the decision was found to be unlawful in this case because there wasn't any evidence that the 1982 decision uh, had been properly considered uh, and uh, still less that reasons have been given for departing from that. So as I say, that, that sets down the, the classic statement of, of the principles in this area. And the headline point really from Wiltshire is this, uh, the doctrine of consistency is not an obligation to follow a previous decision. It's not even an obligation to give particular weight to that previous decision. Uh, it's an obligation to consider the previous decision 
uh, and if departing from it to give reasons for that. And we see that also in St Albans District Council, which is the um, which is a, a much more recent case from 2015. This concerned a decision by the Secretary of State in 2014 uh, to grant permission for a development in the Greenbelt. Uh, the issue was whether that decision was unlawful for uh, departing from uh, an earlier decision by an inspector in 2008. Now in 2014, the inspector stated that there was no need to follow the early decision, provided there are very good planning reasons for departing, uh, and the Secretary of State agreed with that position. And the issue is whether, certainly on, on appeal ground one, uh, the issue is whether the Secretary of State had erred in 2014 uh, by laying down a legal test, essentially, uh, that very good reasons are needed to depart from an earlier decision. And next slide, please, Joe. Um, Mr Justice Holgate recognised that there is a difference between uh, a legal test, on the one hand, uh, and recognising the practical position, on the other hand, that in reality, very good reasons may be needed for departing from that earlier decision. Um, uh, and in the judge's view, that's all the Secretary of State and the inspector were doing in 2014. They were recognising the practical position uh, that in reality, they would need very good reasons for departing from that earlier decision. Uh, the judge also went on to talk more broadly about the limits to the uh, and the requirements of the doctrine of consistency. Um, in particular, the uh, inspector was bound in 2014 to give reasons for the inconsistency. And in quite a neat statement, uh, so neat in fact that we've pinched it for our title, uh, the judge said that considering the previous decision means grasping the intellectual nettle of the disagreement. So as in North Wiltshire, the point to emerge really from St Albans uh, is that this doctrine of consistency is a doctrine that has a twofold uh, content. It, firstly, it's an obligation to consider, uh, and secondly, it's an obligation to give reasons for departing from that decision uh, if that is what the decision maker is uh, planning to do. Um, the judge also considered the content of the duty to give reasons in a case like this. Uh, would it be enough, for instance, for a decision maker simply to note the earlier decision and say, I disagree with that previous decision? Um, in the judge's view, that wouldn't be enough. Um, that is, of course, simply a statement of the disagreement with the earlier decision. It's not a reason uh, for departing. And the content of that duty to give reasons, to explain the reasons for departing, um, will vary from case to case. Some issues will be relatively straightforward. Uh, the reasons won't need to be anything more than fairly brief. Uh, with other more technical or complicated issues, the reasons will need to be more detailed. Uh, but simply noting the inconsistency and saying, I disagree with the earlier decision uh, is not going to be enough. And so we come on then to the third case, which is Davison and Elmbridge, the most recent one of the three. Uh, this involved a decision by the council in 2017 to uh, approve the construction of a new football and athletic stadium in the Greenbelt. Uh, the council had earlier decided in 2016 to approve a similar scheme. Uh, and in making that 2016 decision, the council found that the development would have an adverse impact on the Greenbelt. It then went on to find that the development was nevertheless appropriate development in NPPF terms. Uh, that was held to be an error of law uh, and the 2016 decision was quashed on judicial review. So the question that arose in this case was to what extent does the council have to consider the first decision when making the second decision given that the first decision had been quashed. Well, the council was aware of the judicial review judgment when it made its second decision. I, I think that judgment had been handed down maybe a day before the committee considered that second decision. And when making the second decision, the council found that there was actually no adverse impact on the green belt at all. So in other words, it departed from that aspect of its 2016 decision. Um, and this is on the following slide, Joe. Thanks. Um, so the issue in that case is whether the, whether the inconsistency between those two approaches, 2016 and 2017, gave rise to any unlawfulness. Uh, and Mrs Justice Thornton embarked on a detailed review of the case law in this area, and, and her main findings were as follows. Consistency uh, is a well-established principle, both in public law, but also in planning law too. Um, 
And in planning law, the doctrine of consistency is given effect through the test of material considerations. As we saw earlier, planning considerations, sorry, um, previous decisions, previous planning decisions can be material considerations. Um, the judge also um, identified the principle that the doctrine of consistency is linked to reasons in public law. Um, there is a link, obviously, between the requirement to give reasons and the purpose of that duty is to ensure that decision making is defensible uh, and including that it's reasonably consistent. And there's a link between that duty uh, and the duty, of course, of reasonable consistency. So there's a broader public law link between this duty uh, and another public law principle. Now, the council argued in, in this case, um, and next slide, please, Joe. Thanks. The council argued in this case, in this case, well, the 2016 decision was quashed. So there's nothing to consider. Um, the judge disagreed with that view. Uh, it is, of course, true that decisions which have been quashed don't have any legal effect, but the doctrine of consistency applies more broadly than that. It applies to the underlying reasoning for a decision uh, as much as to the decision itself. And in this case, for instance, the council's 2016 finding that uh, there would be an adverse impact on the Greenbelt was reflected in the environmental impact assessment. Uh, and that remained uh, valid and in existence despite the 2016 decision being quashed. So even though the decision has been quashed, the decision to grant permission has been quashed, um, the underlying reasoning behind that decision can still be relevant and may still need to be considered. Um, and the decision was unlawful in this case. The judge found that the council hadn't properly uh, grasped the nettle of the disagreement um, uh, with its 2016 position. Uh, and the judge also took the view that in a case like this, that rationale uh, of ensuring public confidence in the planning system was heightened here. Uh, this was a case where the council was considering its own application in circumstances where its decision to grant permission for a similar scheme uh, had been criticised uh, and indeed quashed shortly beforehand. And so there's a greater need here, a greater impetus for the council to spell out its reasons for that change in approach. So that was a brief whistle-stop tour of some of the relevant decisions uh, in this area. Hopefully that gives context to Joe's discussion about the Blacker case. Uh, and with that, I'll hand over to him. Thanks, Alex, and hello, everyone. Um, that, that's a really helpful um, scene setting because, in a way, that's the way public law works in a nutshell. You get a case that kind of sets the principle, uh, and then you get a more modern exposition of that, and, and then you get one that really pushes the boundary of the principle. And, and in my view, as, as you'll hear me say in a minute, Davison is, is really at the edges of, of, the, of this principle being robust and um, some of you may know that it, Davison permission was granted to go to the Court of Appeal but for reasons that I don't know um, Elmbridge decided not to take it there so that there's, I think there's an ongoing controversy about whether Davison is is really good law and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a bit because of course it was Mrs Justice Thornton who heard Blacker which I'm going to talk about now and we talked quite a lot about Davison in that. Um, so Blacker then, um, this is the village of Roxwell in Essex, a very nice little village. Um, and there was an application made um, to put 55 homes uh, on a site which was adjacent to, but outside the settlement boundary in the recently adopted local plan in, in Chelmsford. Um, part of the site, the facts aren't particularly important, part of the site was subject to an enforcement um, campaign there was uh, a sort of tidy up issue um, and, and part of the site was earmarked in the local plan as an employment um, allocation um, but it was outside the settlement boundary and there was no justification for residential in in the plan so it was con contra the, the plan um, officers unsurprisingly plan being very recent considered it produced a report uh, which recommended refusal of the application in line with the with the local plan um, and the matter was, I think it was called in from memory by a, a local councillor um, for consideration, uh, brought before the planning committee in November 2020. Now, this is um, at the height of virtual council meetings. And if any of you are sort of interested in um, that, that whole story, uh, one of the features of this case is that both the meetings concerned were recorded and transcripts produced. Um, and they're, they're quite a fun read for reasons I'll come to. 
Um, but the, the key point to note is that there was a, a meeting in November 2020 at which the officer recommendation in a report was refusal of, of planning permission. Now, at the meeting, um, there was considerable discussion about the merits of the application and a number of councillors said openly that they were supportive of the application, notwithstanding the officer's recommendation to refuse for various reasons. Um, I think there was a, a couple of them were talking about contribution to housing supply and the housing crisis. A couple of them were talking about the um, untidiness of the site and the fact that a housing scheme of this kind well um, constructed and delivered would be an improvement, that, that kind of thing. Anyway, there was, a, there was a relatively positive discussion amongst members such that one of the members who was in favour of granting planning permission, notwithstanding the officer recommendation, um, sensing the mood, proposed a, a motion. Um, and, and one of the things that is vaguely amusing about the case is that um, there was quite a lot of discussion about what exactly the motion was that he was proposing. What he was trying to say was, shall we note that the meeting seems to be in favour of granting planning permission, contrary to the officer's report, but there was a bit of back and forth about how exactly you would frame that. Anyway, we don't need to worry too much about that at this stage, because eventually a motion was produced and put to the meeting, which um, proposed deferring the application for further consideration at a further meeting later in time, once um, potential conditions and to some extent reasons uh, had, had been prepared by the officers. Because remember, the officer's report was for, uh, recommendation was for refusal. Um, so it didn't have any conditions because you wouldn't obviously impose conditions on a, on a refusal. The, meet, the mood of the meeting seemed to be in favor of grant. So um, off it went. And the, the motion noted that the meeting was minded to go against the officer's recommendation and grant permission. And in those circumstances to defer further consideration on the basis that I've set out. Now, this is an extract from Chelmsford's constitution. Um, and, and you can see, it's not a full extract, but these are the salient bits. There's a particular uh, reference in Chelmsford's constitution to deal with this exact point. So where it seems that a meeting of the planning committee want to go against an officer's um, recommendation. It, e either way, it doesn't matter, it applies for both. Um, but it says, you can see in the second sentence, the application should be deferred to the next meeting of the committee for consideration of appropriate con conditions and reasons and the implications of such a decision clearly explained in the report back. And then the next paragraph is some rules about how that next meeting will proceed. So Chelmsford certainly were of the view that they were acting pursuant to 5271 of the Constitution. They'd reached the point where 86, the meeting wanted to go against the officer's report, defer for consideration of appropriate uh, conditions. I don't think they wanted the implications of their decision clearly explained, particularly. I think they knew what the implications were, but uh, that was what they thought they were doing. Um, in the meantime, so the matter was then adjourned. Um, that was the only resolution reached. Um, and then it reconvened in, in January. Now I'm missing out quite a lot of the story. There was back and forth of correspondence in, in the meantime, which goes to grounds three and four, but I'm not gonna talk about those because they're sort of fact sensitive and don't, um, don't illuminate the, the issues that we're talking about at all. Um, but it culminated in a, in a further report, second report on the 12th of January, um, or for, for a meeting on the 12th of January, where, uh, a number of conditions were uh, produced, but the report, again, I won't bore you with the detail, but essentially reminded members that all options were still open. No uh, in principle decision had been taken um, and the matter was picking up where it had been deferred uh, in November. Now that, that meeting for various reasons was differently constituted in terms of members. A couple of the members who had voted as part of the majority in the first meeting were not present for non-nefarious reasons. Um, and a couple of others, it was clear, had changed their minds. And again, there's a transcript of the second meeting uh, extracted in some detail in, uh, in the judgment. Um, but it was pretty clear fairly early that the mood of the meeting had changed, probably as a combination of the change in membership. So a couple of the perhaps more 
uh, vocal supporters of the scheme, not not there, and also a couple of others expressed themselves to have thought about it and actually sort of fallen back in line with the officer's recommendation for, for one reason or another. And, and various councillors said different things about that. Some of them had reference to the conditions that had been produced in a sort of slightly Delphic. Um, I've looked at the conditions and, and the conditions have convinced me to row back from support of the scheme, that, that kind of thing. It wasn't totally clear what, why all of them had changed their, their minds. But in any event, again, after a bit of jiggery pokery about the, the motion and what exactly they were trying to vote on, a motion was produced and put to the meeting. Again, this was virtual. Um, and the motion was to essentially to refuse planning permission in line with the officer's report. And you can see from the bottom of this slide that the mood of the meeting had changed really quite considerably, such that it was now vote, that motion was voted on 10 1. In, in favour of refusing planning permission for the scheme. So going against the minded two position from the, from the first meeting. Um, you, you might think that the obvious result to a refusal of planning permission would be an appeal to the inspectorate. And I don't know why that didn't happen. Um, my colleague, our colleague, Wayne Beglin, represented the, um, the claimant in this case, uh, who was a self-professed supportive local resident, Mr Blacker, who had in fact spoken at the first meeting in favour of the scheme um, on the broad basis that it would tidy up the area, which had been a bit of an eyesore and a bit of a problem for um, the villagers of Roxwell for some time, and they would rather a well-managed quiet housing scheme than the um, slightly difficult enforcement situation that was on the site at, at present. Um, the, the, the key proposition that was at the heart of the judicial review claim was that the resolution that the committee had reached at the first meeting now you'll remember i said that that resolution was was to defer but it was on the explicit basis that they were minded to go against the officer's report the claim says at its heart that that resolution was a decision about the merits of the of the scheme and, and it's undoubtedly true um, being as, as generous as I can to, to Wayne and the way he put his case, which was extremely um, skillfully done, incidentally. Certainly the case that the meeting was, in, in a broad sense, in favour of a grant of planning permission at the first meeting. They voted 8-6 to defer on the basis that that's where they were minded to be. But on behalf of Chelmsford, we didn't accept that that was a decision about the merits. We said that that was a stage in the decision-making process that they had reached, at which point the constitution required them to sort of draw stumps, go away and defer further consideration. And in fact, we said that was what the resolution in fact said. Why they had got to that point didn't really matter terribly much. It wasn't a decision about the merits and the focus ought to be on, on the resolution. So that's the, the nub of the issue um, between us. Um, the grounds, just, just briefly, the first ground, um, which I'm not going to spend very much time on because it's um, Chelmsford specific, is that the, the way that the council proceeded was itself contrary to its own constitution. And, and um, Wayne's argument was that um, the, the first resolution minded to grant permission contrary to the officer's recommendation ended consideration of, of that principle. That was a decision on the principle. And what was left was consideration of the conditions for which the matter had been deferred to receive information on. That, that was the reading of the constitution. Now, Wayne was absolutely clear that that was not a proposition of the general public law. We, we all know that in the general public law about planning, you can, you can reach a decision, in fact, a concluded decision, and then change your mind on it before the planning commission is issued. There's a bunch of cases, including Burkitt, which is a key one, which says that. But he said that the particular constitutional arrangements in Chelmsford meant that you couldn't do that. Um, grounds three and four, uh, as I've said already, were kind of fact specific. There was a point about whether Mr. Blacker had been given a proper opportunity to respond to another third party's representation received between the first and second meeting. I won't bore you with that, doesn't matter. And then the fourth one was a, was a sort of broad allegation that members had been sort of railroaded, not sort of, that was the word you'd railroaded into a change of mind, essentially saying, look, it was 8-6 here, it was 10-1 there, what, what happened in the meantime? Um, but again, I, that's interesting because it's kind of gossipy, but you can read the judgment about that. Um, it, it doesn't um, affect the, the nettle point that we're talking about here. 
But ground two, which is, I think, the most interesting from a general interest point of view, um, in a sense, or in essence, the claimant's argument was that um, what the council didn't do at the second meeting was, was grasp the nettle, to pick up Alex's reference from St Albans, of the change of mind. You know, the, the, the meeting had been eight sits in favour of granting planning permission in November. By January, they were 10-1 against granting planning permission. OK, some personnel changes, but some people had changed their mind. Uh, and there was no grasping of the nettle. There was no explaining in the resolution or the or the reasons given for refusal as to why that change of position uh, had occurred. Um, and I'm going to focus on ground two for, for the reasons I've set out because it, it's about nettles. There's a nettle. Um, so gra ground two said or asked, in, in, a, in effect, were the members or was the meeting required to explain their departure from the position, the minded two position that they'd reached at the, first, at the end of the first uh, meeting? And that, to some extent, was answered by whether that was a decision at all, a, a substantive decision. It was clearly a decision to defer. Everyone accepted that and, and its effect was to defer the meeting. But was it a decision on the substance that required grappling with, a nettle that required grasping, or was it a procedural step that that didn't. Uh, and um, Davison was invoked uh, in, in favour to say, well, look, if in Davison, a decision which was subsequently quashed and was of no legal effect can, in appropriate circumstances, require to be grappled with and a subsequent inconsistent decision, why can't a minded two decision, which on the face of it was at least eight councillors for reaching a concluded view that they were minded to grant planning permission. But that was, again, Wayne put it rather more elegantly than I have, but essentially that was the, the question that he was asking, should the Davison principle, which I've already said I think is a high watermark, be extended to this situation? And, and in ground two, what's important to understand in a, in a bit of classic loyally gymnastics, um, this was advanced in the alternative to ground one, that if ground one, which was the constitutional point, was wrong, i.e. they were not bound to limit their consideration only to the conditions, um, ground two was advanced and, and it was accepted as part of ground two that they were perfectly entitled to change their mind. The question being, did they sufficiently explain that change of mind? And, and that's just to pick up on Alex's point, which I think is at the heart of what we're going to say today, which is that this duty of consistency is not is not about outcomes it's not about reaching the same decision or being bound by a decision it's about dealing properly with a previous consistent or inconsistent decision or, or a decision that requires under the principle to be dealt with so mrs justice thornton uh, heard the case now you'll remember she was the judge in in davison so when i heard that she was hearing our case i was a bit anxious because um putting the case on the basis of Davison, where she is the judge who's already accepted, in my view, a, a pretty radical extension of the North Wiltshire principle, which itself led to, has led to quite difficult practical considerations. Having to look at the underlying reasoning of quash decisions is, is tricky. Um, but anyway, I, I didn't need to fear because I think she felt like Davison probably was the high, high watermark. Um, the first place she went is that um, was this central dispute about what decision had been taken at the first meeting. Um, and she found, in line with what the council said, that the decision, the resolution that had been made was only to defer the application. The context for that decision was the minded two position reached by the committee, but the decision making was inchoate, it hadn't completed. They had decided to pause because a point had been reached. And, and the, um, the key issue that um, she uh, drew attention to, and which I think is of wider interest, and which I'll come back to in a, in a moment, was that what mattered here was the resolution in fact voted on. And there's a line of authority which she refers to, um, which says that where a, council where a council expresses itself, it does so by its resolution, the resolution it votes on. And things that are said prior to that resolution, going one way or another, are actually not necessarily relevant to the resolution in fact voted on, because that is the resolution by which the uh, meeting expresses its, its decision. And she, and she rejected ground one on the basis that her reading of the constitution was in line with the council's, which was that it required a, a pausing 
at that point, at the minded two point, in order to consider further, not a an in principle decision. And and she um, accepted my argument. You'll remember that little line at the end that said in the constitution that said in order that the implications of their decision be explained to them. I said there's only any point in that being in there if there's a possibility of changing one's mind because the implica- having it implications explained we all know what that means are you sure you want to do this and if there's no scope for them changing minds later well that's um otios and she accepted that point the remaining grounds um three and four uh, she didn't like either uh, so we we won on on those two um the the bottom line then while we watch emperor commodus um act as justine thornton the bottom line is that and what I see as an attempt to extend the, the difficult Davison uh, high watermark essentially failed. Um, by the, uh, it was rejected by the very judge who decided Davison. And, and in the judgment, she says that Davison is um, itself essentially confined to its own facts. The question of whether a past decision requires this grasping of the metal is, is, is highly fact sensitive. And, and she sets out in the Blacker judgment what it was about the Davison facts that required the, the outcome that she um, contended for. So no extension of Davison, that remains the outlier. Um, in my view, it may well not always be the outlier. I suspect there's a case coming soon which, which might try and row back uh, from that. The principle of consistency does not apply to inchoate decision making. So these facts, but there might be other kinds of facts where a decision is kind of in principle reached or um, but the whole process is not completed. Um, pausing to defer further consideration is not a decision on the substance, or at least wasn't in, in this case, regardless of the context of that. Um, and that really helpful couple of paragraphs in the judgment that when we're asking what did a committee decide at a particular point, the answer is to be found at least primarily in the resolution. What was put to them and what did they uh, vote on? So I'm going to hand over to Ashley now, who's going to explain why this all matters. Thank you very much, Joe. So um, turning to the implications, the first question to ask ourselves is when does this duty arise? Uh, what types of decisions would trigger these legal obligations? Will we get a bit of a clue from the judgment of Lord Justice Limblom in the DLA delivery case? And the case didn't say anything necessarily new about the North Wiltshire principle that Alex explained, um, but it did give some examples of situations where it might arise. An obvious one is a decision on the same application site as the application before the decision taker. Uh, it may also be uh, the same or a similar form of development somewhere else uh, in the country. Um, but perhaps more commonly, uh, it might be uh, an application or decision rather on a different site, but it concerns the interpretation and application of um, a common development plan or national policy. Um, so if any of those situations uh, arise and you're proposing to disagree with a critical aspect of the reasoning of the previous decision, then the legal obligation arises. But um, the DLA delivery list of examples is non-exhaustive. Um, and if I can click to the next slide, thank you. Um, we can immediately conceive of the situation where um, a appeal decision uh, determines on the facts that there is not a five-year land supply, for example. Uh, that is a common example of a decision on a different site, sometimes concerning a different form or type of development, which may be relevant when you're deciding a, a, a different application on a different site. The general question to ask yourself is whether the facts in the other decision are sufficiently closely related to the matters in issue before the decision taker. If that's the case, we then need to ask ourselves, well, what do you do if there is a disagreement? And really, the, the, the law hasn't changed since North Wiltshire. There are two things you have to do. Um, but before 
dealing with those on the next slide. The point to emphasise, as Joe and Alex have said, is that there is no legal duty to decide cases the same. Uh, there's no legal duty to decide the same cases on similar facts in the same way. The legal duty is on the next slide, as um, Alex uh, told us, uh, still comes from North Wiltshire. Um, you have to have regard to the principle of consistency in decision making. You have to front up, you have to confront the previous decision or grasp the intellectual nettle, and you have to give reasons for coming to a different view. Uh, why are you disagreeing with that critical element in the reasoning? Uh, and that all goes to promoting public confidence in decision-making, that it is uh, transparent, that it is uh, on generally objective uh, and robust and defensible grounds, um, but those are not inconsistent um, with different decision makers coming to different views uh, on the same or similar sets of facts. Um, where the content of the duty comes from is clear, um, but the scope of the duty will likely change and differ depending on the type of case that you're dealing with. If, for example, the critical element of the reasoning you're disagreeing with is a purely aesthetic or highly subjective judgment about design or appearance or how it impacts the character of an area, then perhaps more limited reasons would be all that would be required to surpass the legal test. Uh, as we know from what Mr Justice Holgate said in St Albans, slightly more than I simply disagree would be necessary, but perhaps not much more in a, in a case where uh, we're dealing with a highly impressionistic judgment. Compare and contrast, of course, a case where you're dealing with highly technical inputs that led to a conclusion, transport modelling or viability, for example, it would be um, uh, far more likely that a decision taker would need to engage in detail with the judgments that have been reached on those various technical criteria uh, and supply perhaps lengthier reasons for coming to a different view about a, a sufficiently similar decision. Um, turning to the next slide uh, deals with Gladman. Um, this is an interesting case for the illustration of how the principle works when there are lots of different previously relevant decisions before a decision maker. Um, and the facts of Gladman are, are perhaps not going to be uncommon or uh, unusual to many of you listening. Um, the issue in the case, one of them, was about whether a particular development plan policy was up to date or out of date by reference to its consistency with the framework uh, and other matters dealing with the, um, uh, the housing need that it was planning to meet. Uh, the inspector had before him uh, a large number of decisions from other planning inspectors in the district, um, which were not all consistent with one another as to whether the relevant policies in that case were up to date or out of date. Um, the inspector did not grapple with the decisions which said the policies were out of date before coming to the conclusion the policy was up to date. Uh, and that was a failing, so found the judge in that case, which led to the decision having to be quashed. Um, it clearly wasn't the case that he had to come to a particular conclusion. There were decisions going different ways. Um, but what he had to do was do more than simply note that there were decisions uh, that were relevant and that they were conflicting. He had to delve into the detail of those that were disagreeing, uh, grapple with those reasons, uh, have regard to the principle of consistency in decision making and explain why, notwithstanding those previous decisions, he came to the view he did. So to draw that all together, uh, in our summary, um, we say there are four points that we think you should bear in mind. First of all, if there is a relevant previous decision, uh, it should be expressly taken into account in a decision. Um, if the decision maker is proposing not to follow, a critical element of the reasoning of that previous relevant decision uh, give clear reasons why that should be the case. Uh, there is no obligation, however, to come to the same decision, even if they are the same or similar facts. It is finally acceptable to disagree in short form, especially if the critical element of the reasoning that you're disagreeing with 
was uh, an impressionistic or a sub highly subjective one like aesthetics or design more technical matters highly likely to regard to to require more detailed reasons um, so that is a quick canter through where that all leaves us and we turn now to the questions uh, and joe is going to marshal those together thank you thanks ashley um just before i do what i forgot to say but but should say is that um blacker uh mr blacker has applied for permission to appeal um he's applied to the judge at the moment on the papers and we had we don't have an answer but the, i mean usually the judge making the decision doesn't doesn't grant permission and they'll renew to the court of appeal um and they the appeal is um largely on a point that um i've been discussing in the q a box with russell fitzpatrick so thanks for that question i, I guess others of you can see that that exchange if you need to which is about this point about the transcript and what exactly the resolution said and, and all of that and there's an interesting well if you're interested in that sort of thing there's an interesting debate about that but but also going to the point about um which was at the heart of blacker which was what was in fact decided at the, at the first meeting um so watch this space it may be that the court of appeal gives permission um and in so far as the davison principle is considered i suppose it might be said that it's an opportunity to revisit um, what uh, Davison says. Um, I'm going to thank you, everybody, for submitting the questions that you submitted when you signed up. We had lots of those, and that's extremely helpful. We, hopefully, we've answered a great deal of those in the course of, um, of our talks. Um, we're going to try and answer just a few of them now. Time doesn't permit all of them to be dealt with. Um, so I'm sorry if you asked one and we, we don't get to it. But by all means, if you're dying to ask it, again then stick it in the q a or in the chat box I've, I've been trying to answer some questions in the chat box as i've gone through as well um i think we're going to start alex is going to start with a question from um hayden let me just get the, the name right uh no he's not he's going to start with a question from julie parkin i think i don't know whether julie's here but anyway alex over to you that you want to just set out what the question is and then um answer it. this one is essentially how do we advise planning officers and, and committee members in terms of the weight that they're to give to previous decisions? Um, now, we have sort of picked on this particular question because I thought it was very interesting. We had a, a detailed discussion between the three of us yesterday about uh, questions like this, and quite a few of them were coming up, which is why all, all three of us have laboured this, this point in the talk itself and hopefully answered the question. Um, the answer is uh, that they are free to attach to those earlier decisions whatever rational weight they see fit. Um, provided that the decision is rational, then the decision to disagree with an early decision is perfectly, um, perfectly sound. Um, what they're required to do, however, is give their reasons, having considered that early decision, give their reasons for departing from it. Uh, and in that regard, it'd be helpful, I think, to give their reasons for attaching whatever weight they want to attach to it as well. Um, but uh, uh, as we've said, the, the duty of consistency or reasonable consistency it is a duty simply to consider and explain. Uh, it isn't a duty to follow an early decision uh, and it isn't a duty even to attach particular weight to that decision. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Thanks, Alex. And then Ashley, I think you're gonna deal with um, Hayden's question. Yes. yes, the question from Hayden Morris, thank you, is um, I'm curious to know more about the role of previous decisions influencing planning authorities' reaction to similar, in my view, sufficiently different proposals on the same site where the previous decision was reached in the absence or misunderstanding of evidence provided. And the answer to that question is that if it's a sufficiently similar decision, um, which if it's on the same site and concerns similar form of development, one would presuppose it is, um, the decision taker should expressly take that decision into account when they're deciding the live new um, application. But if it transpires that that previous decision was indeed made in error or in the absence of relevant evidence, or perhaps more likely that new evidence has come to light since that decision, which casts that one in a different light. Well, that would be a perfectly rational basis to say that the decision is going to be different uh, on the later application than the previous one. 
as long as that's clearly explained and articulated in the decision making process in a delegated report if it's by officers or uh, in an officer's report supporting a committee decision or if members are taking a different view that it's clearly set out in the minutes that informs the resolution um, that there would be no uh, legal basis on which to challenge that decision unless it could be said to have been irrational. Thanks, Ashley. And then um, I'm going to deal with one from, from Lisa Skinner. I, Lisa, I should thank you because, as will become apparent, this is exactly the kind of question that you want as, as a barrister, um, because the answer lies in part in another of my cases, which I did in the Court of Appeal last summer. So it allows me to tell you all that I was in the Court of Appeal last summer, which I still feel good about. Um, the, the question is, what would the advice be if an application has expired? I think probably a permission has expired and the adopted local plan is the same, but the council decides to make a different decision, citing design and the framework. Um, unsurprisingly, the answer is it, it depends. Um, but in um, my case, which is called um, Bates and Malden District Council, there was a similar situation, which was that a planning permission for a new house had been granted in 2014. And although it hadn't expired by the time of the second decision, it had all but expired because it couldn't be implemented because of various conditions about bird surveys. So to all intents and purposes, it had expired and it, and it therefore wasn't a fallback position. It couldn't be prayed as a fallback position because it couldn't be implemented if the subsequent application for an identical scheme were, was refused. Um, but things had changed in the meantime um, unlike Lisa's question, the local plan had in fact changed, although probably not materially, and the housing land supply situation had, had changed. Um, and in that case, the, the Court of Appeal make reference to the principle of consistency. Mr Justice Hicken, uh, sorry, Lord Justice Hickenbottom, who gave the lead judgment in that one, went to North Wiltshire and the authorities and said, reminded everybody, as we've tried to do, that it, it's, not a, it's not a principle about outcomes. It's a principle about about grappling, and in in that case, there was a sufficient grappling with um, the previous decision, which, albeit not a fallback, was still a recent decision of the local authority about an identical scheme. And so, insofar as a different decision was sought to be reached, it would have to be explained. And in that case, on the facts, you can go and read it. And the, the duty had been complied with. But it's quite an interesting um, set of facts, quite close to your. Um, suggestion, Lisa, but just to go back to it, what's the advice if the council decides to make a different decision? Well, it follows from everything that we've all been saying that the, the absolute key thing to do is to acknowledge the change of position and explain it. Now, how good that explanation is, how watertight it proves, is, is nothing to do with this principle. That's about qualitative planning judgment and, and it might be a bad decision and you might get overturned on appeal to an inspector, but that's really nothing to do with any of this. The, the point is to explain why the decision maker is reaching a different decision, whether that's by reference to change policy or change circumstances or, or whatever you like. Um, that The duty will be fulfilled if you grasp the intellectual nettle and explain why you're reaching a different uh, position. Um, th then there may be, um, I'm gonna stop sharing that screen because I accidentally went back to the beginning there. Um, there may be some some more questions. I, I don't know whether any of you have found it possible to put any in the question and answer box. I can see not not yet. Uh, I can see there's another one in the in the chat. Should I just deal with that quickly? Um, should we, as officers, mention all the appeal decisions we want to highlight in the delegated committee report, or can some of them be referenced at the appeal stage? Um, that's a good that's a good question. Um, in this context, my view is that you. If there are decisions which require grappling with, so if there, if there are previous decisions which are sufficiently similar to invoke the principle of consistency, then you should mention them at the decision making stage. It's risky to leave them to appeal stage. Um, but whether they are in fact such that they require grappling with, in fact, that reminds me quite a lot of the questions asked about housing land supply, most of them from Braintree as it happens. Hello, everyone at Braintree. Um, Housing land supply is tricky because that is very fact specific and changes all the time. New sites are granted, um, the trajectory changes, um, sometimes national policy changes. I think it's quite difficult to say that a previous decision on, on the state of housing land supply requires, well, it's impossible to say it requires the same uh, 
determination at a later um, decision. It may be that if literally nothing has changed between decision one and decision two, which is, I think, the case that arose in Braintree, if I remember rightly, then that might well require some grappling with. Um, but again, just to, again, the stuck record reminder, what we're talking about here is not requiring the same outcome, not requiring the same decision, but requiring an acknowledgement of and grappling with the nettle. Do either of you want to add anything to, to that? Or indeed anyone? Yeah, I'm happy to, to I entirely agree with obviously all of that, Joe, but especially with the appeal stage point, um, if even if it's legally permissible to leave something out of the delegated report, I think you're opening yourself up to criticism at the appeal stage, um, that you didn't take it into account and that had you done, um, you, know, you could have come to a different outcome and that that may, in serious cases, lead to an award of costs. So um, for, for good practical reasons, as well as the... Um, good legal ones that you mentioned, Joe, I think it's very sensible to set out clearly in a delegated report the relevant previous decisions you've taken into account so that nobody could criticise you either in the courts or, or, or before an inspector. Um, what Leslie and I have been having a, an exchange, the suspicion is, Leslie, that you've got a case to which this applies, <laughs> but I'm very happy to help if that's so. Um, you, the latest question is if the resolution is based on conditions and reconsideration of the impact of only one of uh, of one only of the council's planning policies, can the discussion or new resolution extend beyond that on return of the items to the same committee? I'm going to answer that in two ways. One, constitutionally, as, as a matter of the constitution of that authority, it, it, it depends. The case argued by Wayne in Chelmsford was that they could not, that the constitution prohibited consideration of or reconsideration of the merits more, more widely. Now, the facts aren't exactly on all fours, but I think the same point applies. Now, on the reading of the constitution, Mrs Justice Thornton disagreed with Mr Blacker on, on that and said that the, particularly that line about implications being explained implied that you could go back. And of course, the Burkitt line of authorities Kaidi's Burkitt says that up until you issue a planning permission, you can change your mind on it. But in certain circumstances, you may need to explain why. So as a matter, of, so that's the constitutional point. As a matter of the sort of planning law point more generally, I think I'm afraid, given that I'm sort of anticipating where you are in that um, particular case, that they probably can revisit the, the principle beyond what they said they were deferring to. But again, in that case, they will almost certainly have to explain why, why they've gone broader. It would certainly be safest for them to do so. Whether they have to in light of um, Blacker, arguable, depends on what the resolution was, depends on what, on what was said. Um, but it, there's no reason why they shouldn't at all. And actually in lots of these cases, even though in, in my case, in Blacker, they, they didn't explain, had they been a bit more careful, some of the members to say, this is why I've changed my mind. I suspect that we wouldn't have got as far along with the JR as, as we did. It, of course, it got permission. It was heard substantively. So um, Mrs Justice Lang thought it was arguable, which, I mean, might not be saying a great deal, but um, she tends to think things are arguable. Um, questions are piling in now. Should, should I hand over to one of you two to deal with another one? Leslie, I hope that, that helps. Um, any, any further answers, you can send me an email and um, instruct me in the usual way. <laughs> I'll take one of the ones that's just come in. Um, when making a decision on a planning application or a listed building consent for works to a property, what weight should a council give to an inspector's decision where the inspector has overturned a council's earlier refusal for an identical scheme on a neighbouring property? Um, again, I think questions of weight are for the decision maker, um, provided that it's a rational decision to attach whatever weight the decision maker sees fit, then that's a question for them that depends on the precise circumstances of the case. So. The doctrine of, of consistency shouldn't prevent you from disagreeing with the early decision, uh, shouldn't prevent you from attaching whatever weight to that decision that you see fit, provided, of course, that it's rational weight and provided that you've explained your reasons. And we have um, an interesting question about planning inspectors. Um, Jeff Lyon asks, are planning inspectors required to consider and explain how they have considered similar appeals addressing similar policy points in the same authority area? across a similar time frame, in many cases, we are seeing divergence in inspector decisions without evidence 
uh, of consideration or explanation. Um, obviously, that's a fact specific point. But in general, if, if there was a decision which, for argument's sake, was relevant to the issues in dispute in the appeal, um, and the inspector didn't grapple with it or said something to, to the to the effect of um, all cases tell their own merits or something glib that Mr Justice Holgate tells us in St Albans isn't sufficient, that may amount to a, an error of law, um, applying the principles that we've explained. Um, it, it might be that a decision wasn't cited to an inspector uh, and that's where it becomes slightly more complicated because the DLA delivery case uh, did decide that um, even where a decision of the Secretary of State, so another PINS inspector decision or Secretary of State decision, um, wasn't drawn to the inspector's notice, um, it still could be capable of triggering the um, legal duties that we've explained. Um, how and when that occurs, I, I expect will be difficult and on a case by case basis, because obviously PINS issues many thousands of decisions each year, um, it wouldn't be reasonable to expect an inspector determining a comparatively small scheme to, to be across every decision issued across the whole country that may conceivably have dealt with a point. But if there was a, a very prominent Secretary of State um, decision, a call in or a covered appeal or something of that nature, where a particular policy approach was settled about the approach in a particular district to its spatial strategy or its uh, consistency with the framework, then one might perhaps expect that it's reasonable for PINs to be aware of that when it takes its decision. But realistically, um, to, to, to avoid that nuanced legal argument, it, it's in the best interests of the council, if that's who you're representing or, or indeed the appellant, to draw to the attention of the decision maker all the relevant decisions you want them to grapple with um, so that you just avoid having to deal with that complicated legal point with unpredictable outcomes. So if there is a decision that you think they need to look at and it goes in your favour, or if it goes against you, but you've got good reasons for distinguishing it, um, important that you draw it to their attention expressly and set it out ideally in writing in a statement of case or closing submissions so that nobody can say the inspector wasn't on notice to deal with the point. A good question, thank you. Yeah, I think it's right to say isn't it, that DLA was concerned with the treatment of, of development plan policies and the, and the approach to to the same development plan policy in, in, in two different ways in quite quick succession for, from memory. Um, that was Baroness Cumberledge, wasn't it, who brought the, I think that's the other name of that one, or is that a different case? I don't know. No, that's, that's exactly so, right. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Um, uh, for fear of mispronouncing your name, I'm going to deal with Avgelinos's question about democratic officers. Sorry if I've got that wrong. Um, how active should democratic officers be in committee in relation to the application of constitutional principles to avoid uh, to avoid legal challenges later on? Um, I, my view is active. You know, if if your democratic officer in concert with the legal advisor are worried that there's a constitutional wrinkle coming up, or the constitution requires something, or requires you to do something different, then I, it's much better to deal with those actively and head on in the meeting than it is to let them slide and hope that you can explain it away afterwards. Um, I mean, I, that isn't supposed to be an invitation to intervene at all moments with, you know, arcane points of constitutional principle, because that isn't helping anybody. But if, like in Blacker, you know, that there, there was a, a clear um, constitutional provision, which sort of at least appeared to govern the situation, then um, in that case, the legal advisor did very helpfully intervene and and that was at large that was that was noted so I, I would say yeah to avoid legal challenges later on know the constitution and and remind members of it if they're about to pile into an area of it that they shouldn't be as it were or go or go somewhere that doesn't deal uh, with it properly um shall I just wash up a couple of the other ones too Helen Reeves says can the passage of time be a reason why a different decision is reached I, I'm going to be a lawyer again Possibly. I think the passage of time pure, on its pure self probably isn't going to be a great reason. But the passage of time implies a bunch of other stuff like policy changes, like situational changes, like national policy changes. 
So often what we're talking about is the passage of time, but also its implications in, in other ways. I think if all if everything was identical, save that it was two years later, I think that would probably be quite difficult. That probably wouldn't amount to grasping the intellectual nettle. That's probably closer to the glib, I disagree, because it's two years on. Um, I don't know whether, actually, Alex, you have any thoughts about that. No, I agree. Um, but that's not to say a second decision maker couldn't grasp that nettle and and correct, uh, uh, come to a legally secure outcome by saying, I disagree because, and then whatever the three critical inputs were to the design conclusion and supply their own independent judgments. I mean, it's important for us to remember that this, as, as we've said, isn't akin to precedent in court cases where there's a requirement in some instances to follow a previous decision and must be distinguishable. Um, this is about an administrative decision-taking exercise and showing that uh, all the relevant factors have been taken into account in a transparent and logical and legally defensible way. So um, the fact it's two years old of itself, as you rightly say, I think would be extremely difficult to say was a cogent reason. But you might say, well, I you know, take a different view on that. The circumstances around are different, policies different, um, or, or simply I've just taken a different view on the same facts. But as long as the critical inputs into the conclusion were fronted up and, and explained, then I would have thought that decision would be legally sound. Yeah, on that basis, I, I agree, absolutely. Um, David Jones says, I think, apropos what we were saying earlier, and I, I totally agree, this is an accurate description of what inspectors often say. Inspectors generally say not that they're not fully aware of other circumstances relevant to similar appeal, and then ignore the outcome. I mean, the last bit, maybe they're ignoring it, maybe they're dismissing it, I don't know. But again, the, the, whether that engages this principle will depend on what we're talking about. You know, if often um, decisions of previous inspectors will be circumstance specific, and so the inspector can completely legitimately say, I'm grappling with the nettle of that by saying, I don't know what the circumstances that arose there are, and, and those circumstances must have been, been influential. What I do know is what they are here. The only caveat to that is if you're talking about something where the circumstances don't really affect it, I can't think of an example, then you might want a bit more from an inspector. Then you might say, well, look, we really do need to know why um, you aren't going with a, a, recent, a recent decision. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A as well. Um, lo lots of you are using the chat and then others are using the Q&A. Richard Cobb says, I think helpfully that at the moment, recordings of the meetings are available on the website so you can replay the debate. Well, we had a very good transcript in, in Blacker, so we didn't, didn't need that. But uh, I, I do um, just sound a note of caution. I'm, I'm not sure how helpful actually <laughs> having recordings of the, of the committee uh, or even transcripts are. Um, so you might just want to be a bit cautious about how valuable it is to <laughs> record all of your meetings in perpetuity so that we can go and crawl over them. And, and I, as usual, agree with Mel Corbishley that member training is, is key. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree with you about, about that. Um, we've, we've got, um, I think, Philippa, hello, Philippa, just, just um, agreeing with uh, Ashley and then Helen saying thank you. So it looks as if we might have got to the end of... Um, of the questions, which is extraordinary timing because it's exactly midday or a couple of minutes after. Um, unless either of you want to add anything else, it doesn't look like it. Um, I'll, I'll just thank everybody for coming. Um, we really appreciate your attendance at these things and in particular the questions that I think illuminate these webinars. So thank you very much for coming along. Um, and as usual, if there are questions that arise that you um, thought of but didn't get answered, then feel free to email one or, or all of us and, and we'll forward them to Ashley um, to, to answer. Thanks very much, everybody, and I look forward to seeing lots of you again soon.